numbers of people who died happily in their beds. Is there no punishment? Is there no counting? Are some of the worst dictators in the world going to die assuming that they really got the best of the world and did all right? I think that if that is, if, if we're to see a larger hand of God's justice, a final balancing of the scales, then there must be a place for heaven and hell. And I would add to that, the only way heaven and hell would make any sense to me if there really is, if there is also a purgatory. Purgatory is not hell light. Um, you know, it's, it's not like 10,000 years of burning in flames and then you get out. Uh, purgatory is about the continuing purification of the person beyond death. And, uh, you know, with Gary, I agree. There are lots of thoughts of, there are a good number of people I would like to see go to hell. <laughs> and and, and I, that's not just a throwaway line. Uh, there, there are people who have done horrible things. Some of them with full consciousness of it. Others of them kind of stumble into it. I'm thinking of our own president right now. Okay, I don't want him to go to hell. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just thinking there are people who have caused enormous suffering in this world. And, and yeah, I would love it if there's some kind of justice for them. But I, I'm, you know, once you say there are some people that deserve to go to hell, well then what about those in the middle? Well, that's where you need something like purgatory. But I just want to say, I have no idea what happens beyond death, and I'm not going to worry about it. Martin Luther, the spiritual mentor of my childhood, had lots of great lines. One of them was, the afterlife is God's business. I don't have to worry about that. My question is for both of you. In that you have fellowship with God, how would you characterize the way that God communicates to you? And when you have the sense that you've heard from God, how can you be sure that you've heard from God? feel like that country western song, Operator, get me Jesus. <laughs> um, I, I can answer that seriously, but you might want to go first. <laughs> How does God speak to us? I think he speaks to us through his word, the Bible, not in a mechanical sense that we open it and find a promise for the day, or that everything in the Bible applies to us, but a careful study of the word, um, an attempt to discern God's leading uh, through the way he's spoken in scripture is a primary way in which he speaks to me. Through prayer, through reflection, through meditation, through observance of the sacraments, I would say God appears to me. Mm -hmm. Speaks to me. Yeah, and the way I would, uh, I, I don't disagree with anything Gary has just said. The way I would approach the question based on my own experience, is this. For me, um, prayer and other forms of spiritual practice are primarily about centering more deeply in God. I've never heard God speak to me in the sense of, uh, what? You know, you know, that kind of inner voice that has syllables in it. Um, but the more centered I am in God, um, the clearer my discernment process is. And if it's a difficult discernment process, I always involve other people in it. So, uh, and I guess I would say, if you think God is asking you to do something kind of weird, Check it out with other spiritually mature people, okay? Um, discernment has almost always been a communal exercise in Christian circles. The notion of spiritual friendship or spiritual companionship is very ancient in the tradition. So, I, I would agree with Gary, I, I'm quite happy to use the metaphor of God speaking 
to talk about what I sometimes experience with scripture, uh, what I sometimes experience in a worship service, what I sometimes experience on a retreat and so forth. Um, but for me, the real point is that centering in God and then seeking to discern not from a distracted place or a fearful place, uh, but from a real grounded place. Uh, can't we solve it all by simply saying it is a mystery? Uh, isn't God a mystery to us? God is certainly a mystery to me. I don't understand God in a rational way. Right. It seems to me we can avoid a lot of these questions, a lot of the technicalities of interpretations, if we can accept the vision of God as a mystery. I'd be happy for your comments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I, uh, I agree. And I would want to say God is mystery with a capital M. Then I would go on to say to be Muslim means to live in a tradition that is shaped by the Quran. To be Christian means to live in a tradition that is shaped by um, uh, the Bible and what we know of Jesus and so forth. Um, but I think, I mean, for me personally, it's utterly crucial um, for even glimpsing what the notion of God is about, to say that God is beyond all words, all categories, all concepts. And um, whenever we think God can be adequately captured in words, we're no longer talking about God. So I'm, if I understand you correctly, I'm completely one with you, even as I want to go on to say, and being part of a particular community means that one says, these are the stories we tell about God. We need to avoid, this is kind of a fresh thought, we need to avoid the human tendency toward excessive precision and certitude. I think that has bedeviled much of, and I'm kind of using that word deliberately, I think that has bedeviled much of uh, Christian theology throughout the centuries. That quest for excessive certitude and precision. And then I would add, for me, the primary task of theology is not to construct a system, and by theology I mean the intellectual side of the Christian faith. The primary task of theology is to get rid of the artificial stumbling blocks that keep us from beholding the mystery. My take on that would be somewhat different. There's no question that God is incomprehensible. He's beyond all our human categories. Um, but it's a bit of a, in, an intellectual cop-out, it seems to me, to say that that's the end of the discussion. Of course God is beyond our ability fully to grasp him. On the other hand, God isn't ineffable. God isn't completely incapable of having some description of him. And the description we have of God, which I believe is the correct one, is that that we find in Scripture, because it's in Scripture that God has revealed himself through prophets and apostles. So when I want to know what God is like, I don't look inside myself. I look at Scripture. I go, for example, to Isaiah chapter 40, which describes God in all his splendor, in his magnificence, his, his tenderness in a variety of ways. That tells me God's view of God. Now, does that, does that solve all my questions? Of course not. It may even lead to more questions. But I know what God is like because he has chosen to accommodate his words, his language, his categories to my understanding, as simple as they are. And for that reason, I, I believe that we can know God theologically, but then, of course, know him experimentally, that is, in ourselves. But based not on just a mystery which we can't comprehend, but on what we know of God. And God makes himself, I believe, apparent, visible through that means. That is, through the means of the description. And I would say we can tell parables about God. Gary, this is uh, directed towards you. Uh, if I understood you correctly, you spoke of divine intervention and your belief in it. How would you explain the Holocaust and such events and the lack of divine intervention? Well, you're asking me as hard a question as you could ask tonight, and I'll give you the easy answer. I don't know. 
Um, uh, God's, God's ways are beyond my understanding. I think they're beyond most of our understanding. Um, Winston Churchill once said that if you don't believe in God, um, you should look at the Jewish people. It would take a divine miracle for them to have continued to exist uh, on the face of the earth for as long as they have. Uh, there have been many attempts to destroy the Jewish people. This was the last one. It certainly wasn't the first. I could name several before. Some of them mentioned in scripture, the book of Esther and elsewhere. Uh, clearly, it seems to me Satan, as the ruler of this world, has desired to eliminate the Jewish people from the face of the earth. And I would say God has not allowed that to happen. Why did he allow so much suffering to happen in that compact form? I have no answers. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I, I have an imperfect answer. God is in charge of history. God's will will be done. Um, this Longfellow who said, the mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. There is a perspective sometimes that comes from looking at things that happened long ago and, and seeing the, the beginning from the end. That is seeing a purpose that isn't apparent when we go through that. I don't like easy answers. There is no easy answer to the one of the Holocaust. But I think we have to say that either God is in charge of history or history has little or no meaning. I say that, by the way, as a historian. <laughs> you, you would not say that the short-term events of history are controlled by God or that God is in charge of I mean, if you say God is in charge of history, it almost seems as if, I mean, what are you saying? Well, I'm saying, <laughs> I mean, did, did, is I'm it saying God's will that, that Jesus, the power? Jesus said, not a sparrow falls by accident well, without God, God knowing yeah, them. And I'm I asking think, you, what does that mean? God what it means me? is that everything that happens in history has, has a meaning, as hidden as that often is from us. Luther talked about Deus ab Scandidus, the, the hidden God. But some and things that happen in history, are, if I understand you correctly, are because of the rule of Satan. You, there, isn't that what you just said? Well, what I'm saying is that God is the Lord of history. Nothing happens without his foreknowledge and determination. Uh, on the other hand, really? the evil, yes. And, and I would say Satan is the author of evil. Satan is the author of the Holocaust. Does that mean God stepped aside and said, all right, Satan, now it's your turn to do this. No, there is a, there is a, 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 a weave in history. There is a providence in history. When we look at the things close up, we don't see very much. That is, it's meaningful. We often see things that are that make no sense at all. Does that mean that God is not in charge of the For religion? example, was, was it the will of God that um, we start a war against Iran? You're, I think you're, you're dealing there with... Uh, and that's to be a short term, right. long term. Right. You're dealing there with individual initiative. Does everything that happened in history happen because... That, that's what I'm asking yes. you. All right. yeah. Yeah. And I would say people do things that are contrary to God's, to God's desire, but there is a larger sense in which everything that happens fulfills God's purposes. Uh, it's an unanswerable question, Marcus. I wonder it's, if it's just uh, <laughs> an unmeaningful affirmation. Well, yeah. and I, if, if I were the first person to think that, I would say yes. But uh, it's the Christian doctrine of providence. Whoa. The Christian doctrine of providence says...